According to the Mohammedan records, did Muhammad actually predict anything? If so, what? And has it come true? Al-A'raf 7.157 Those who follow the Apostle, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel. For he commands them what is just and forbids them what is evil. It is upon this singular verse in the Quran that the followers of Muhammad, after his death, created a voluminous literature attempting to connect Muhammad to the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. They evolved the most astounding set of mendacities, perversion of language, as well as contortion of history and theology in a pitiful and pitiable manner to glorify their false mentor, as we shall currently show. In the Hebrew Bible, in Moses' last sermon, he addressed the people of Israel with the following verses, among others. Deuteronomy 18.15 The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. I will raise them a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. In Deuteronomy 18, 19 to 22, we find an even stronger warning. If anyone does not listen to my words, that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Ladies and gentlemen, the words of the Bible are almost never ambiguous. They flow like a slow-moving, gigantic river with a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Unlike the miasma of the Quran, which has no beginning, no middle, and no ending that can be seen in any chapter, let alone as a book. The God of Israel and Jesus makes it crystal clear that the prophets following Moses will be from the seed of Isaac and Jacob Israel, and no one else, not even Ishmael. And they all were. Furthermore, and most important, is the title of the God of Israel. It is Yahweh and not Allah. It is a title since it means I am, which is not a name. It has the meaning that the Almighty is unknowable, infinite, unfathomable, eternal, omniscient, and omnipotent. According to Muhammad's Quran, Allah, on the other hand, is shown to be finite, unmerciful, unsure, wavering, vacillating, thereby repeatedly abrogating earlier statements and instructions deceitful and of course most relevant of all is not called Yahweh. We need to ask how it is that these men have come to have the office of prophet. What gave them the authority for calling themselves prophet? When we go to the scriptures we find that God delineated as qualifications for the office of prophet four categories. A. A prophet must be born in the prophetic line of Isaac. B. He must speak in the name of Yahweh. C. His message must conform to the message which has gone before. D. There must be verifiable accomplishments to the Prophet's predictions. Let us together go through each of these four categories one at a time. A. Muhammad, according to his Quran, was from the seed of Ishmael and not of the seed of Isaac. Hence, he fails the first condition. B. A Prophet must speak in the name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, the unique name which he gave his creation to use. What exactly is that name? It is the Hebrew name for God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai in chapter 3, Exodus, consisting of the four consonants YHWH, known as the Tetragrammaton. In Exodus 3.1 to 16, where God talks to Moses at the burning bush, we find God referring to himself as I am, which in Hebrew is pronounced Yahweh. And the Almighty continues by saying that this is my name forever signifying that it is his eternal name, the name which only God can take for himself. Muhammad fails once more the second condition. C. The Prophet's message must conform to those that were revealed earlier. 
Here again, Muhammad and his Quran failed miserably since Muhammad was not circumcised, nor did he make it mandatory to his followers. Thus, he broke the very covenant that God made with Abraham and all the males of his seed for eternity. Moreover, Muhammad's Quran does not follow the biblical food prohibitions, nor do the verses of the Quran represent a true reflection of those of the Bible, but on the contrary, they are perverted and twisted versions of them. Yet again, does Muhammad fail this time the third condition? D. There must be verifiable accomplishments to the Prophet's predictions. Let us together again explore the very Arabic sources in the Ahadith regarding this subject. Aisha, his beloved child bride and the mother of the believers, asserts the following. Sahih al-Bukhari Hadith 6.378 narrated by Masruq. Aisha said, and whoever tells you that the Prophet knows what is going to happen tomorrow is a liar. If Muhammad could not even tell what would happen on the morrow, then he could not possibly have predicted anything. Sahih al-Bukhari 4.401 narrated by Auf ibn Mali. The Prophet said, count six signs that indicate the approach of the hour. My death, the conquest of Beit al-Maqdis, the Temple of Solomon, a plague that will afflict you and kill you in great numbers, as the plague that afflicts sheep, the increase of wealth to such an extent that even if one is given 100 dinars, he will not be satisfied. Then an affliction which no Arab house will escape, and then a truce between you and Badil Asfar, that is the Byzantines, who will betray you and attack you under 80 flags. Under each flag will be 12,000 soldiers. As we all know, not one of these predictions came true. Invariably, some followers of Muhammad will bring up the following verse regarding the Roman conquest of Persia as indicative of prophecy. Al-Rum 30.1 The Romans have been defeated in a land close by, but they, after their defeat, will be victorious within a few years. The Byzantines actually did become victorious over the Persians, who had at first defeated them. Yet, there are fundamental problems with this alleged prophecy. According to Yusuf Ali, the Arabic in a few years signifies a period of three to nine years. Yet, according to the historical records, the victory did not come until nearly 14 years later in AD 630, not the few years alluded to in the Quran. Moreover, the Hadith collection of Al-Bukhari provides further corroboration that Abu Sufyan's visit with Heraclius occurred after the signing of Hudaybiyyah in 632 AD and hence after the Byzantine victory. Sahih al-Bukhari 4.399 narrated by Abdullah bin Abbas that Abu Sufyan bin Harb informed him that Heraclius called him and the members of a caravan from the Quraysh who had gone to Sham as traders during the truce which Allah's Apostle had concluded with Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh infidels. This verse was revealed as usual with Muhammad after the event and hence there was no prediction. Furthermore, Muhammad claimed that the Antichrist, called the Dajjal, was to appear shortly after the Muhammadan conquest of Constantinople. The following traditions are taken from Sunan Abu Dawood 37.4282, narrated by Mu'ad ibn Jabal. The Prophet said, the greatest war, the conquest of Constantinople, and the coming forth of the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will take place within a period of seven months. Sunan Abu Dawood 37.4283, narrated by Abdullah bin Busr. The Prophet said, the time between the greatest war and the conquest of the city of Constantinople will be six years, and the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will come forth in the seventh. Actually, Muhammadans conquered Constantinople in May 1453. Based upon the preceding traditions, the Antichrist was to appear in December 1453 at the earliest. Hence prophecy regarding the Antichrist advent to take place seven months after the conquest of Constantinople did not materialize. But probably the most popular miracle which has been passed down by the Hadith and fomented by the Muhammadans even today is the splitting of the moon by Muhammad. It is recorded in Sahih Muslim 4.1467 by Abdullah bin Mas'ud. We were along with Allah Messenger at Mina. That moon was split up in two. One of its parts was behind the mountain, and the other one was on the side of the mountain. Allah's Messenger said to us, bear witness to this. 
The splitting up of the moon is not simply a fable from the ahadith, but is alluded to in the Quran as well. In Surah Al-Qamar 54, titled The Moon, begins by saying, the hour of judgment is nigh and the moon is cleft asunder. From the context, it is obvious that this was meant to be a sign, but people reject it as such, and in their desire to create some supernatural proof for their faith, interpret it word for word. Even today, you will hear Muhammadans claim that the American astronauts, upon landing on the moon, took pictures of a large crack or fissure on the moon's surface, which is what remains from Muhammad's split. For those believers and unbelievers who want more such intellectual gems, please go to the internet and be regaled. As far as we are concerned, enough is enough.